Welcome back to VMworld 2021. My name is Dave Vellante. And right now we're going to talk to one of VMware's partners and unpack how containers and cloud native development processes and tools are changing the way we think about managing storage. And specifically, we're going to dig into the partnership between VMware and Portworks, a company acquired by Pure Storage last September. And with me is Michael Ferrante, who's the Senior Director of Product Marketing at Portworks, which as I said, is now part of Pure Storage. Michael, welcome back to theCUBE. Good to see you again. Great to be here, thanks for having me. Now, Michael, if you're in storage, you got to partner with VMware. So that's always been an important relationship for Pure. And of course that's carried over to, to Portworks. But how does Portworks work with VMware? Where does it fit within the VMware ecosystem? And, and you know, what's your point of view on, on VMware's Kubernetes play? We'll, we'll come back to that, but, but how do you fit in? How do we fit in? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. So, you know, customers who are building modern applications um, are often doing it on uh, Kubernetes platforms. And VMware has um, a, a fantastic Kubernetes platform with Tanzu. And, um, you know, customers, when they run applications that have data on Kubernetes, um, they have certain requirements around data protection, around data security, um, uh, data mobility. And Portworks has a platform that solves those problems for customers um, on any Kubernetes platform and regardless of infrastructure. So, so a, Kubern, uh, a VMware customer who's saying, you know what, I love the idea of being able to run Tanzu across my on-prem data center and my cloud footprint. Um, and I want to move my databases um, or between those environments, or you know, maybe just take a backup of my database and put it in the cloud. Well, when they add Portworks into their Tanzu environment, uh, they get the ability to do those types of things, data protection, data mobility. And so we help customers expand their Tanzu footprint by solving the requirements that come along with modern applications. Yeah, and that's important because as we've covered extensively in theCUBE, in the early days of, of, of container, well, containers have been around forever, but in the, the early days of modern containers, if you will, you know, the applications, the data was ephemeral, kind of throwaway, if you will, but, but over time, it's become more, more stateful, requiring better security and governance and recovery and the like. So, Michael, what's your point of view on VMware's Kubernetes play? You talked about Tanzu, it's a big part of the strategy. It's an ongoing topic of conversation in the community. And there's other solutions, of course, like OpenShift, which, which also runs on yeah. VMware. What's your perspective on VMware's progression, how they're innovating with Kubernetes orchestration specifically? Well, I think VMware is making um, a lot of smart moves and you know, other players on the market uh, should, should not uh, discount them. Um, I think you know, there's a lot of interest um, in Tanzu um, and you know, we're having conversations and we're kind of expanding our relationship with VMware um, to solve a broader swath of those use cases. So I think it's going to be a compelling offer in the market. Um, that's what makes this ecosystem so fun. Um, is that there is, you know, there are multiple, uh, there are multiple solutions from the cloud providers, from the kind of the independent, um, kind of non-cloud associated uh, platform vendors like VMware or Red Hat. Uh, that makes it really exciting. Let's back up a bit, maybe talk about some of the big picture trends and, and maybe some of the challenges. You know, Port Portworks, you were early on in the management of storage for containers. And I got to say you personally, and I mean that, you created a new distribution channel through developers and DevOps teams who they became really influential in storage decisions, which they never were before. Yep. That's a, that was a completely new dynamic. So maybe talk about the evolution of, of storage for containers that you've witnessed. Where do we come from? Where are we today? And where are we headed? Yeah, I, I mean, what, what's interesting is that so, uh, on a certain level, Portworks is a storage um, a storage solution for containers. In fact, you um, called us the gold standard of uh, Kubernetes storage. Really proud of that. Love, love anytime someone calls you a gold standard. Uh, but here's the thing, um, our, the people that buy Portworks um, don't typically buy storage. Um, these are platform architects, uh, they're DevOps engineers. And what they need is they need to consume storage the same way that they need to con consume uh, compute and network, but they're not storage administrators. And so what Portworks did and other companies in the ecosystem is they've given an API driven self-service experience for um, what were classically ticket-based infrastructure 
uh, purchases. And that has accelerated um, developers' ability to, um, to build and run applications, um, and especially with Kubernetes being able to orchestrate that. And I think now, even within the VMware ecosystem, where you, VMware clearly has um, strong relationships with the typical infrastructure buyers, uh, but now those infrastructure buyers are seeing what their what their DevOps peers are doing, and they're saying, "Hey, we want that too. We want API driven. We want self service. It's we don't like tickets any more than you do." Um, and so, being able to kind of solve enterprise level requirements, uh, whether it's around data protection or a data security, but in a model that um, that allows for self service um, in in API drivenness. That's not a word. Um, really. Um, opens up a lot of possibilities. And I think in some ways it's a self-fulfilling prophecy because when you can solve enterprise level requirements, but to also provide agility, then people want as much of it as you can possibly provide them. So that that DevOps sort of mindset, that train has left the station. It's got a lot of momentum. It's not, we're not going to flip that. So what happens in your view to the role of that storage admin that you talk about? Does he or she, does it, do they widen their scope? Does that, does their activities, does it evolve? Does there go away? Do they become, do they become ops dev pros? How do you see that? Yeah, it's a, it's a great, um, uh, it's a great question. And we've been thinking a lot about this. We actually have a new product out called Forex Data Services. And what it is, is it's a database as a service platform for Kubernetes. So imagine you're running um, Portworx on top of uh, on top of Tanzu. And what your what your company wants to do, what IT wants to do is provide a service catalog to developers internally where they can click a button and have an elastic search cluster or click a button and have a Postgres database. Well, now these storage administrators can actually become um, SREs, um, which is kind of, you know, that's that's what we call these really senior DevOps engineers at places like you know, Google and Twitter and Uber, where you're actually responsible for using code and software to run applications. And so with services like PDS, the, the, those individuals can can um, up level skill and up level their value within the organization and provide a bigger impact. I love that. So they're going from basically pulling tickets, you know, putting out fires, dealing with paper cuts, to actually having a much more strategic role within the organization. Exactly. From infrastructure to applications. I mean, applications is where the business value always is, and you need agile infrastructure in order to run agile applications. But if you only solve if you only have agile infrastructure, then you still haven't solved a business problem. Um, and, and PDS is enabling our customers to solve those real business problems. Well, that leads me to my next question, because a lot of organizations, of course, have renewed their focus on digital. Every, every organization has, has no choice. If you're not a digital business, you're out of business. But, but what I mean there is we were kind of forced into digital last year, and, and now organizations are stepping back and they're being more planful. So there's an emphasis on modernizing infrastructure and applications. What's the role that you see of Kubernetes and VMs in that shift to modernizing uh, the, the infrastructure apps and the business? Yeah, it, so what we saw in the pandemic is um, companies that had to do more with less. And despite that, those that adopted Kubernetes were able to accelerate application development um, they were able to scale their applications faster. In fact, we have, we have one customer, uh, Roblox, a massively popular online gaming platform for kind of, you know, uh, tween age kids. Um, they actually IPO during the pandemic. And in the first week, that kind of that March timeframe, the beginning of the pandemic, they scaled in a single month, what they had scaled in the entire previous year. And the only way they were able to do that was with these modern architectures. So companies have had firsthand experience saying, okay, when we, when we build cloud native, when we use microservices, when we use Kubernetes, we can scale faster, we can get to the market quicker. And so let's keep those learnings and let's accelerate them. Um, and so, you know, the reason we're doing um, a pure validated design uh, with, with, um, with Tanzu and Portworx is to help the VMware ecosystem take advantage as well of those modern architectures so that they can get the benefits, not of just of the agile infrastructure stack provided by VMware, but also the, um, the applications here um, that goes along with it. So I mean, you, you made the point before, it's all about the applications and, and take that further. It's all about the, the value that you, the time to value that you can get out of deploying applications. So based on what you just said, 
about those with versus those without uh, during the pandemic, you know, you, the, begs the question, why wouldn't everybody have done that? So, so the question is, what are the biggest challenges that you're seeing in terms of adopting and deploying Kubernetes in production? Yeah, so I actually have some data that I can share on this. We just did a survey um, of 500 IT pros um, across the US and UK with significant knowledge of their company's Kubernetes strategy who are currently running data services on Kubernetes. And so we asked them, how's that going for you? And what they told us is basically what I, what I just said earlier that their 55% can get apps to market faster, 50% say that developers are more, more efficient. And actually a third of those say, in addition, we're, we're actually able to reduce our, our, um, our IT infrastructure costs. But why, why isn't everybody doing it? And so we asked those questions and they're struggling with business requirements around uh, backup and recovery, data mobility, data security. Um, and I think that is, that's the missing piece, which is when you can figure it out. And you know, if you're Uber or your, uh, you know, your Facebook, you can hire engineers to figure anything out, right? Given enough time and budget, you can solve anything uh, with, with computers. Uh, but for the vast majority of organizations, they need a solution to enable them to have the same outcomes as the companies who can build everything themselves. And so with, you know, with Portworx data services, uh, by, by adding Portworx into your Tanzu environment, uh, you actually get kind of quote unquote for free, a lot of those business requirements that are, that are holding back um, enterprise adoption of um, critical applications within the Kubernetes um, ecosystem. And as a result, then you can accelerate uh, a, a larger portion of your application portfolio. Hey, Michael, so one of the good things about virtual events, particularly, you know, VM world is you don't have to fly out on a Saturday or Sunday and come back on a Friday. The flip side of that is you don't get the hallway track, you know, <laughs> so and it's an awesome event. It really kind of kicks off the, the fall season. So help the audience. What are you looking for at VM world 2021 that's relevant to your space? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I'm interested in anything um, that really kind of, you know, helps customers figure out how to really embrace hybrid and multi-cloud. I mean, it feels a little bit like it, it's it's the infrastructure week of the uh, of the political world that it's all we're always talking about it, but it's never happening. But I've actually seen a lot of um, a lot of uh, movement to suggest both in our own customer base as well in new products that are coming to market that are really helping customers take advantage of this multi and hybrid cloud world. Um, it's, it, so I, I think it, it, it's really happening. So I'm looking for announcements around that. Um, I'm also always interested in um, security because I think you know the, the, the online world is just a more and more dangerous place um, every day, whether it's ransomware attacks um, or other more traditional uh, security threats. And so I think you know, as a community, we need to figure out ways in which we can both enable customers to move faster deliver apps more quickly, scale them more quickly, but also make them more secure. And that's why I was really hardened to see on our survey that when people apply automation through platforms like Tanzu or Kubernetes more broadly, that they actually get security benefits in addition to um, kind of the, you know, the scale and the productivity benefits. So I'm looking for more announcements to come out on that front as well. Uh, if I could follow up on that, because historically, the, the more secure you are, the less flexibility you have. The reverse is true. The more flexibility you give users, the, the less secure they are. Now, I'm, I'm hearing that that may not apply in the case of, well, actually probably the answer is it probably does apply in the case of Kubernetes and containers, but that's why they need port works. But, but square that circle for me because- Yeah, so um, it, there is usually a trade off. It's, you know, we, we really value security. So we're going we're to slow down and we were going to take a very, um, you know, uh, progressive approach to rolling out changes, um, to securing access, um, to limiting, you know, who can have access to data, et cetera. Um, the, the flip side is, you know, it's, you know, move fast and break things, kind of the mantra of Silicon Valley, um, which, you know, you, you, you say that to a financial institution on the East Coast and they're going to kind of roll, roll, roll your eyes and say, what are you smoking? So I, but there is a way to solve it. And, Computers are can can take the, the the very very deliberate approach, except they do it extremely fast, so it doesn't look as deliberate. So basically, what I'm saying is you can build in security best practices, but then use fleets of servers 
to run all of those checks, to make sure that the person who is trying to access the system is the one in my enterprise auth system that should be able to access that system. And so you can basically get manual people-based checks out of the way because you're leveraging automation that is doing those checks. It's not like we're, we're, we're letting things be open. It's just we're leveraging computers for the things that they are really good at. And that's how you square that circle, which automation enables you to put in place more checks than you can do manually, but they happen a lot, lot faster. And so you end up getting the best of both worlds and kind of breaking this long-standing tension between agility and security. And, and a key linchpin of that, I'm assuming, is APIs that allow you to connect to whatever the best of breed uh, uh, identity governance and access management system you want to use. Is exactly, so we have you know, one example is we have PX Secure. So this is all about role-based access controls and encryption for your mission critical data that's running on Kubernetes. Well, we have APIs for that. And we and you know, we build it into things like core works data services um, and build it into things like our storage classes. So all a DevOps engineer has to do is say, yeah, I want this app to be sec secure, meaning encrypted, and that's going to follow my role-based access controls that I'm defining in my corporate auth system. And then it's automatically applied. Um, that that's really the key is something is only secure if you actually do it. Um, and a lot of times, because it's so cumbersome, either developers look for workarounds um, or they just, they, they simply don't do it. It gets bolted on at the end. Um, the, the kind of phrase of art with, within the security is shift left, mm -hmm. bring more of that stuff earlier. But I think it applies not just to security, but also to data protection, um, to data mobility. Let's build all of that stuff in right from the beginning. Um, and that's one of the big design principles of what works. One of the discussions we're always having is, okay, we've seen this rapid shift to digital. This has so many ripple effects, what's permanent? So what are the big changes or trends that you think are going to be permanent or will dominate, not just VM world this year, but, but themes for the coming years? Yeah, so what, what genies are out of the bottle? Um, and I think a big one is just from an architectural perspective, this move to microservices. I mean, it just, it makes so much sense for so many reasons. Um, you know, how often do any of us get a maintenance notification anymore from a consumer service that we, that we use, whether it's, you know, uh, restaurant delivery, whether it's, you know, streaming, whether it's even, you know, you know, a health, um, a health app that, that we're using. We don't, um, but that's very common in the enterprise that you would shut down, you know, the ERP system uh, for, you know, three days, you know, every six months to do an update. So that stuff is going away. And the, the way in which we no longer have to issue those notifications is we have microservices that can be independently updated, um, that can use um, kind of specialized tooling that makes sense for the job. So I've, I have an app that really needs the indexing capabilities of Elasticsearch versus I have an app that needs the very fast data processing with Cassandra. Um, and so it, development teams can be more independent from one another, have less dependencies, develop applications faster, get those products to market faster. And I think the, the, the pandemic has demonstrated how, you know, it, I'll, 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 I'll say Amazon wasn't successful because of the pandemic. A lot of people said, oh, well, of course they sell online. So this pandemic was a boon for them. Well, they actually created architectures that were able to withstand the massive increase in demand that they got. Our customer Roblox is another example. If they did not have those, those, same, those architectures that enabled them to scale at those levels, then I, you know, Roblox wouldn't have been able to IPO because they would have just been a story about everybody wanted to play Roblox, the website crashed, end of story. So it's about building architectures that allow you to take advantage of um, this movement to, towards digital. And I don't think that's going away. But this is where you know the solutions like Tanzu come in. You know, folks don't know how to do it, um, and they need platforms that make it easy. They need platforms that enable them to um, secure their data, to to make it available, to protect it. And so, you know, combinations of like Portworx and Tanzu really solve some of the issues that come up in this this shift to microservices. Michael, great stuff. Really appreciate your perspectives, and and thanks for coming back in the cube. Yeah, my pleasure. Anytime. And hopefully we'll be able to do it um, uh, in person one of these days. I hope so. All right, and thank you for watching everybody. This is Dave Vellante. You're watching the continuous coverage of theCUBE's 
coverage of VMworld 2021. Keep it right there.